I cannot stop studying on mineral of analysis. And today I'm also going to speak on mineral of analysis, specifically applied to uh, uh, particular submarine power cable tension measurement. In fact, this is something particular which was used between Sweden and Germany going under the Baltic Sea. In fact, uh, I keep on talking about the formulations, mathematical formulations, but I tried to keep it much simpler and decided to uh, uh, explain what this mineral technique, what mineral technique is, and what the problem is that we are uh, trying to apply, and also what we want to get from it, from this analysis. So I will try to keep it as simple as possible. This uh, the work we started when I was there in Sweden, uh, in collaboration with Berlin Nilsson and Sven Mordebo, both from Linnea University, Great Church. And, and this collaboration is in fact still going on. I mean, uh, of course the research takes us somewhere else sometimes and we go from that direction. And I don't think it will end at a stand soon also. So, what was our motivation? First, I'd like to talk about that. Our motivation was, uh, try, was to keep uh, or to derive an accurate mathematical model, electromagnetic model for the Baltic power cable, submarine cable. It's a high voltage direct current submarine power cable. It's uh, produced by AGB Sweden. And in fact, this was a project uh, which started with the support of ABB company uh, who produced these cables. And we decided to uh, drive an accurate electromagnetic model for them. And uh, the ultimate goal of this project was, in fact, uh, to localize the faults in these cables. I mean, uh, maybe you've heard of that before, but in these power cables, sometimes uh, a partial discharge occurs from the outer conductor to the inner conductor. It's some sort of lightning. Uh, when the lightning happens in air, it's not so problematic because it's gas molecules and they uh, end up uh, at the previous position very quickly. But when it happens in the dielectric, it cannot be the same anymore. So you have to find the location of this fault and change the cable there. When the cable is underwater, and when it's a 250 kilometer long cable, it's very important to localize the fault uh, as accurately as possible. That was the idea, in fact. So that's why we needed a mathematical model rather than a computational model, because we needed accuracy more than uh, practical. The cable was used between Trelleborg and Lübeck. Uh, this is southern Sweden and this is northern Germany. There are two lines and this purple one is 250 <coughs> meters long. In, uh, starting from 2010, uh, there has been experiments made on this cable. Uh, the experiments were repeated several times until now. And this is uh, the moment when Sven Nordebo himself is he, there now. He's trying to make the experiment. It was a picture from 2010. He did that again several times more. Uh, so we made some measurements in time domain. In fact, the measurements were done in time domain, but uh, and of course we converted them uh, to frequency and in the effective the measurement results. And uh, at the same time, we tried to derive this electromagnetic model and try to see uh, how our model. Uh, with next uh, measurement results, is it well or not? This was the measurement setup. We needed a connector between a correction cable and a real power line. The uh, pictures are not very clear to see. And this is the model uh, for the power cable. In fact, there are many layers in these power cables. It's not a very simple correction cable. It has uh, 10 layers at all. And then some layers there are semiconductors, and some layers there are insulators like direct materials, and some layers there are there's lead or iron. So uh, it's in fact a little bit complicated. This is a simple model for the measurement setup. There's a coaxial cable here, uh, which is connected to an oscilloscope or something, a uh, measurement device, something like that. Uh, we need a connector between the coaxial cable and the power line because they don't have the same diameters and so on. So uh, this connector was uh, produced by ourselves and there we see the power line which is a very complicated one uh, with many layers. So this is the geometrical model for that. Here we model the equation line, here is the connector and this is the power line. When we see this in fact we see a lot of scattering mechanisms at once. 
First, we have step discontinuities here. Sorry. When there is step discontinuity, the scattering mechanism starts and there are scattered fields uh, propagating them on the waveguides. This is the first scattering mechanism. There is another one which are the coatings on the walls of the power bank. So these are not perfect electrical, electrical conductor walls. These, are, these can be modeled as impedance surfaces. And also there is a third scattering mechanism. A crop changes in the media. Here there is another, here is a medium, here is this, with uh, air, free space, and here there is another medium. So <coughs> it's changing also, which can cause scattering. So there are three types of sketching mechanisms at once. But of course we cannot handle them at once, so we have to do it step by step. First, what we did, starting from 2011, we, we decided to investigate the step discontinuities first. We analyzed these two problems with mineral technique. Then we combined them uh, with the use of generalized sketching matrix method. So if you solve these problems, this is straightforward. You don't have to spend so much time to get the results for the third one. This was the first book that we had done uh, about electromagnetic modeling. Then uh, we decided to analyze the coatings, put layers, several layers, and we uh, derived a dispersion model for the multi-layer coaxial waveguides. This was going independently. We use this model, dispersion model, in the third problem. And this was the last uh, step we have done about that. In the future, what we plan to do more is we want to derive an approximate boundary condition for the multi-layer surfaces, because now, now that we, have, we know what the dispersion equation is here in multi-layer waveguides, we can make use of it to derive an approximate boundary conditions. This is the first target that we aim to do soon. Then we will study the abrupt changes in the media. Uh, probably we would prefer to use mode matching technique there, which is much easier than we know the technique. These are, these are future plans. So I want to talk about what the winner of method is first. And who are these people? That's more important. Uh, there are two guys, Wiener and Hoff, who drive this. And these are the two guys. In fact, these are very interesting characters. I will talk about their characters first. Uh, they derived this method, winner of method, with a paper written in 1931. How they ended up doing that first, I want to talk about Wiener first. Uh, he was born in the United States, in fact, but he is from Jewish German origin. His uh, father and mother were Jewish and German. And his father was a teacher, a high school teacher. He decided to educate Wiener himself. He didn't send him to school until the age of nine. Then he uh, eventually sent him to school. And at the age of 11, he got his high school degree. Then at the age of 14, he got his bachelor's degree from the mathematics. Then at the age of 17, he was patient. It was a quick life. <laughs> it is very quickly. But, but he paid for that because he became a very interesting character. After the, the First World War, and, uh, after he was 22 or uh, something like that, he started to work in MIT. And uh, throughout his career, he was there in the MIT, and he was very famous in MIT. Uh, not because he was a genius, of course he was a genius, but because he was a little bit absent-minded, I should say. He, he was forgetting everything, almost everything. And there are too many jokes about Wiener in MIT, still to, uh, being told about. One, I can tell, for instance, one day he leaves his office from MIT, goes home, he finds his house all empty, no furniture, no family. And he, can, he cannot understand what's going on. He finds a little girl in the neighborhood. He, he asks where the Wiener family is. And she says they moved that day, that particular day, a few blocks away. They are living in a different street now. And he says to the little girl, thank you very much for the information. And the little girl says, no problem, daddy. My mother sent me to the here to pick you up to the hall. <laughs> he cannot recognize his own daughter sometimes. <laughs> I don't know if this story is true or not, but there are too many stories like that about Wiener. He was such a guy. On the end, also, he was very untidy, I should say. His papers can never be understood. He doesn't, you cannot understand where he starts to uh, tell the story, uh, tell his hypothesis. When he stops, you cannot tell that. 
you understand almost nothing. Mainly, if you decide to read these papers, you end up being more confused than before. And uh, sometimes, a few times in his career, he went to Germany as a sabbatical, and he met a lot of people from Germany. Of course, he was from German origin, so uh, he was familiar with the culture. And he met Eberhard Hof in Germany in, uh, during one of his visits. He invited Hof to MIT in the beginning of 1930, and he, he offered Hof a position of assistant professor, and they started to work together in the beginning of 1930. Uh, on the contrary to Wiener, Hof is very tidy, very disciplined, and very accurate. His papers are very well organized. He is almost the opposite of Wiener as a character. But they were very happy working together, and uh, immediately they developed this method, Wiener of method. In, in fact, it was developed first as a method to solve an integral equation, then uh, this method was adapted to many other areas. After working five or six years together, Eberhard Hof uh, accepted a job offer uh, from the University of Leipzig, Germany. Uh, they offered him a full professorship position and a lucrative salary, and he decided to accept that. The only problem was that the offer was coming from German Nazi regime. And uh, because he accepted that job offer, the scientific community never forgave him. Uh, almost they tried to erase his name from almost everything he found. He has found and successfully they did uh, somehow. Of course, Eberhardov was also very sorry for that decision that he made at 1936. Uh, after the Second World War, he went back to the United States and became a U.S. citizen. When asked to win art, remember he was Jewish. He said uh, he said that he uh, did not blame both for this decision because it was a very good offer. It was hard to say no. But I don't know what his uh, real feelings are. I just know that they were not in connection anymore after they died. Uh, also, from this minor equation, in our method, there was another uh, method developed from that. Uh, it's discrete version. Uh, in fact, maybe you've heard of that. It's called Wiener filter now in signal processing, digital signal processing. In fact, it should have been called Wiener Hof filter because it's the uh, outcome of the method, but because the scientific community did not want to use of names, of name, it's now known as Wiener filter instead. It's somehow said, somehow interesting story that they had to together, but uh, there's something uh, that they are certain they were both good men and <coughs> they did a lot of things until they died. What is Wiener of method basically? In fact, it's, it relies on integral transform applied to the Helmholtz equation. Probably you've heard of Helmholtz equation before. And the boundary conditions and quantum interrelations related to the specific problem we have. So we can imagine we have this. The Helmholtz equation in frequency domain, boundary conditions and quantum interrelations. When we apply integral transform to all of them, we end up with some sort of uh, mathematical uh, expressions then we need to apply the radiation condition to these expressions that ends up with a new winner of equation, something called winner of equation. Of course, these procedures sometimes take many pages, but still, uh, the idea is quite simple. Uh, so, about solving the winner of equation, I will tell, uh, talk about the procedures very briefly, but at the end, we use the edge conditions in addition to these beauty boundary conditions and continuous relations, and that gives us the solution. The Wiener of equation looks like some, uh, this, this is the simple version of the Wiener of equation. Here we have two unknown functions, f minus and f plus are unknown functions to be solved. What we know about these functions, uh, f minus is an analytic function, a regular function in the lower half plane, and f plus is a regular function in the upper half plane. That's all the information we know about that. This g alpha is called the kernel function. And uh, all, it's always, it always consists of the physical and the geometrical properties of the problem. In fact, this describes the problem, usually. And this uh, little g alpha uh, usually describes the source, what sort of source we have. And this is only valid in this intersection region. This is the mathematic, mathematical function that we need to solve after we apply the integral transform to all the conditions and information we have. In fact, uh, basically we have four steps to solve a Wiener of equation. First step is called Wiener of factorization. This kernel function should be factorized 
as a multiplication or a division of a plus and minus function. G plus must be regular and free of zeros in the upper half plane, and G minus must be regular and free of zeros in the lower half plane. These two methods, both of them are acceptable. For instance, if we use this one and write G plus times G minus here and divide every term by G plus, we end up with this equation. This is the end of the first step. Then, as a second step, we call this F plus, F, F alpha, and we need to break, decompose this as a sum of uh, two functions, which is what the uh, regular in the upper half plane and regular in the lower half plane. Then if we substitute, substitute this in, instead of F alpha, we can arrange the linear equation in this way. This way now we see that left hand side of this equation is regular in B minus in the lower half plane and right hand side is regular in the upper half plane. So we can separate all the terms with this classification. The third step is called principle of analytical continuation. In fact, it's a general principle in complex calculus. Uh, we suppose we have two functions. One is called f1 alpha, which is regular in b1, and f2 alpha, which is regular in b2, and they are equal to each other in the intersection value, intersection domain. Uh, then we call f2 uh, is f2 an analytical continuation of f1 from b1 to b2 through this domain. This is called analytical continuation. And we can introduce a function called p alpha, which is equal to f1 f in the region b1 and f2 in the region b2. So they were equal to each other in the intersection domain, so this doesn't violate anything. That means this p alpha will be regular in the union of these two regions. We use this idea to solve this linear equation. Uh, this is regular in the lower half plane, this is regular in the upper half plane, and they are equal to each other in the intersection domain. So we can introduce a function p alpha, which is equal to this expression in b plus in the upper half plane, and this expression in the lower half plane. Then p alpha should be uh, a regular function in the entire domain, entire complex uh, domain. That means it's an entire function, which has no, which doesn't have any singularities at all. The last step to solve the linear of equation is the Lewis theorem. It's a one sentence theorem. It's very simple, but it's very uh, uh, delicate, I should say. Every bounded entire function is equal to a constant distance. Uh, by using edge conditions, we can easily prove that this P alpha is almost always bounded, and that's why it should be equal to a constant. Then if we introduce a constant instead of this P alpha, there we have solved F plus and F minus at the same time. This is the method that we use uh, while we are trying to solve the equation. The good thing about the physical problems, usually this constant is equal to zero in physical problems. But of course you have to prove it all the time in every problem. Because at least once I have seen that uh, when it's not equal to zero. This is the method that we use usually. Until now, what we have done, I try to keep it as fast as possible because it's very complicated mathematically. And I omitted a lot of slides, uh, not to make you bored. Uh, the main problem is analyzing three steps. This is the main problem that we analyzed lately. But first we solve this problem, then we solve this problem, then we combine them uh, by using generalized Getting matrix method. These two problems were analyzed by the New York City. Briefly, I will show what we do for this problem. Uh, this is a coaxial waveguide. Here we have perfect electric conductor walls, and here we have impedance walls. Because of the discontinuity uh, on the surfaces, we have scheduled mechanism. Uh, we can call the phi component of the magnetic field as function u. If we call this u, then using the uh, well-known Maxwell's equations, we can uh, introduce the uh, rho component and the z component of the electric field in terms of this function u. Of course, you have to keep in mind here that we have used e to the power of minus i omega t time convention. Usually, you will see the e to the power of plus j omega t. That is the opposite. That's why. Uh, here you don't see minus j, you see plus i. Uh, the incident field is a TM transverse magnetic mode. 
electromagnetic wave uh, written in terms of this mode shape function and these are the best cell functions, usual best cell functions this is the best cell function of the first kind and this is the best cell function of the second kind uh, we introduce a total field which is the sum of the incident field and the scattered field so this U will represent the scattered field we uh, write down the boundary conditions which are satisfied on each wall these are the boundary conditions these two are well known perfect electrically conducted boundary conditions and these two are known to which boundary conditions which represents uh, sort, uh, impedance surfaces in, in terms of the function u these four conditions can be written in this manner it becomes complicated now what we do uh, we apply Fourier transform Fourier integral transform to the uh, Helmholtz equation and all these boundary conditions one by one and we use radiation conditions then we find these two mineral equations it doesn't look uh, simple uh, but we are not interested in all the details now here we have Q plus which is an unknown function Q plus these are regular in the upper half plane we have Q minus and Q minus which are regular in the lower half plane there are four unknowns the two mineral equations which are uh, which must be satisfied simultaneously because we see the Q plus and Q plus in both equations so we cannot solve them separately independently we have to solve them simultaneously uh, this P plus and Q plus P minus and Q minus in fact comes from the Fourier transforms we don't know these functions that's why we don't know what they are when we apply the Fourier transform we represent them with P and Q functions also we see some uh, Functions here, V1, uh, V2, Chi1, Chi2. These are the uh, kernel functions that, that we end up with, and all these, in fact, involve some sorts of SL functions, as we see here. Uh, if we write them uh, explicitly, it takes some time. And these two represent, of course, the source. First of all, we need to do factorization, as I said before, this is the first step to solve the linear equation. We have to factorize this V1, function V1, as this. If we put minus alpha instead of alpha, then we end up with V1 minus alpha function. So, the split functions are in fact uh, symmetrical to each other. If we use these split functions in the linear equations and divide all the equations by V1, V1, V1 minus alpha and V2 minus alpha, we end up with these two equations. Now that we can see first term here and the second term is regular in the upper half plane and these two red ones in the, are regular in the lower half plane, but the black ones are still complicated. Then we need to decompose the right hand sides. Here we see the right hand sides. We, have, we need to decompose them. We can write them as a sum of uh, two functions with one. Uh, one is regular in the upper half plane and the other one is regular in the lower half plane. We represent the one regular in the upper half plane in the blue color and the one regular in the lower half plane in the red color. When we substitute these in the uh, linear of equations, first linear of equation, we look like this. Now we only we are only left with one term to be handled. The others are uh, already separated from each other, and the red ones and blue ones can be seen. What we do here, we have another problem here. We cannot do factorization because if we do factorization, we ruin these ones. That's why we have to find another way to handle this. And uh, until 1978, there was no method to handle this. But in 1978, Mitati Devan developed a method to handle this. And he, he called this method weak factorization. What we do here, we take this term right, and we at the term here, uh, where this tau, tau q is the poles, the, the zeros of this chi1 function. So when we add this, this square bracket will become 0 divided by 0 at this specific point, and at the other points it has no singularity at all. And this a q is of course the residues of this poles. So here, with adding this term, we uh, make it regular in the upper, upper half plane, but we added one term. So we have to add it here also, otherwise the equation would be a different equation. But this term itself is regular in the lower half plane, so it's not, uh, it's not a problem to add this. In this way, we can uh, now represent all the terms 
either regular in the upper half plane or regular in the lower half plane. That was the uh, aim that we had we needed to do at the first step. These residues of these faults can be calculated very easily by taking the limit of this term at this specific alpha value. And we can write them explicitly here for Q, R2, and going on like that. The second linear of equation has a term like that also here. The first term is complicated. We do the same here. It has different poles because this function is different. We add something different and we do the same here. That's why this should be minus. That's why we ended up doing the equation and uh, we ended up uh, with separate terms regularly in the upper and lower half case. So, uh, by using analytical continuation and Lewis theorem, we can solve P plus and Q plus at the same time with these two equations. Uh, to know what they are equal to uh, explicitly, we need to substitute these two values, uh, nu Q and tau Q, in these P alpha and Q alpha, and solve them uh, with some numerical methods. Numerical because we can uh, construct a system of linear equations. Then what we need to do after solving these two functions, we need to take the inverse Fourier transform because we are looking for u, function u, not p plus and q plus. And this is another issue. You need to use Jordan's lemma, Cauchy's theorem, uh, the law of residues, and so on. Then you will find some sort of residues here. This one will represent the reflection coefficients related to the reflected T in M mode. And these coefficients are the reflection coefficients of the uh, reflected transverse magnetic bonds. The results are looking like that. These are the results. I mean, uh, these should make you happy when you see <laughs> uh, Of course, to draw uh, plot them, you need to uh, use some sort of method. Uh, Then we solve this problem and combine them. When we combine them, we use generalized sketching matrix methods. This is a very well known method developed by Pace and Mitra, Raj Mitra, in the late 60s. Uh, what, is, what is that basically? The generalized sketching matrix. When you solve this problem, you can construct an S matrix, a sketching matrix for this problem. You can construct a sketching matrix for the second problem. Then you can combine them with uh, introducing some uh, phase shift matrices also and construct the sketching matrix for this problem. Uh, when you use uh, phase shift matrices, matrices uh, and take the phase shift to zero, the length to zero, it you end up with this equation. These are in fact square matrices, all them like all by themselves. This is a square matrix, this is a square matrix and so on. And I will briefly talk about the mode engine technique as well. This is a very simple method. I can say you honestly, this is really very simple. But if you know uh, a little bit on about wavelengths, you can directly understand what mode engine technique is. Here you see two regions. This is region A. This is a correction wavelength. That's why this region and this region are the same. And here you see region B. In both regions, independently, there will be some modes uh, which propagate in the wavelengths to uh, both directions. It's easy to derive them because you can. You usually do that in your courses. Uh, you write down the eigenmodes and eigenfunctions related. That's all with the uh, handling situation. You can do that for the region A and the region B separately. You can see here T and M mode, and these are transverse magnetic modes. And uh, these two mode shape functions can be derived from the dispersion equations. Uh, then you use the continuity relation at this specific region. Uh, you can call this z equal to zero. Uh, here, the electric and magnetic fields should be continuous. You use that information, and then uh, immediately you end up with a linear system of equations which can be solved numerically very easily. Uh, so, in fact, you don't have to use linear technique all the time, but we do. Why? Because we have to prove that not mention technique gives the gives as good results as we know of technique by meaning. Usually it does not. And we have, to, we have to know when it does and when it does not because then we can decide when to use it or when not to use it. And the numerical results are here. 
for uh, one centimeter, three centimeters, and ten centimeters uh, wave drive for the walls of the fractional cable, and the surface impedance zero point one I. This blue line represents the result for the linear rope technique, and the red one represents the result of the modeling technique. We can see that at low frequencies they agree very well. In, uh, when the frequencies get higher, uh, the agreement is not as good. It's simply because we need much, much more elements in the mod machine testing to have accurate results. Because in theory, to have 100% accuracy in mod machine technique, you need to have infinite number of elements. It's not possible numerically, that's why you have to truncate it somewhere. Uh, if you, have, you, you need to work in high frequencies, you need to have a much bigger truncation number, which is computational uh, time. But usually, in our particular uh, application, we usually are interested in these low frequencies. And uh, with this analysis, we could see that we could use both techniques, which would give as, accurate, as good accuracy as possible. And uh, maybe at some point, we don't have to deal with all these complex characters all the time. More matching techniques is much, much easier. Uh, we compared these two techniques with, for different values also. Uh, different impedance values, and we saw almost the same results for each value. We also compared the results for the area ratios uh, for the two parts of the correction wave right? and we saw that when the area ratio increases, the reflection coefficient also increases. And also the effect of the surface impedance was also studied, and we saw the same result there. Then, uh, recently what we have done, uh, we the beginning of the presentation, I talked about that a little bit. We studied the dispersion modeling of this multi layer proteins. And uh, what we did, we used vector ray functions, a very different technique, not mineral technique, not non energy technique, it's a new one, uh, I mean, new one for us. Vector ray functions were introduced for each layer, and then the boundary conditions and the continuity relations were considered uh, at each interface. And the structure, general structure of the fields were looking like that. When we applied the boundary conditions, we saw these equations. This is the first interface, this is the last interface, and these are intermediate interfaces. So then we have another system of equations to solve. In this system, our unknowns are these values, the P sub function, K sub 1, rho sub 1, and so we introduce them as unknowns and solve that numerically. Uh, we want to do that because we, in the near future, we want to develop an approximate boundary condition for these multi-layered walls. And we need to know where the wave numbers should be for each mode. Here, this is the uh, most accurate results that we can get. This is the quasi-TEM mode, the location in the complex plane, the wave number of the quasi-TEM mode. And this is the first transverse magnetic uh, mode, T and 0, 1. And the second one will be probably somewhere here, if we go on like that. Uh, when we derive the approximate boundary conditions, we will analyze our own wave numbers and see if they agree well with this dispersion modeling. This is the uh, paper that was published about the latest analysis we have done. As I said, now we are going to use these results for the uh, approximate boundary conditions. In the near future, we plan to do that, of course. We also plan to work on the result changes of the media, but this approximate boundary condition issue is much more important for the future of this research. And there are also other things that we plan to do. Uh, 